This is the second of two videos in which we discuss the devices within the two broad regions of a microprocessor. In the previous video, we explored the memory region, where the data is read from and written to. Here, we'll explore the processor region, where the data is operated on. The processor centers on the ALU, or arithmetic logic unit. As the name suggests, this device can do arithmetic or logic operations. You can think of it as a calculator. There are two input values, here named A and B, each with four bits, and one function select, which together determine the four output bits. This is a simple ALU example with just eight possible functions listed here. The function number and its operation are arbitrary. For example, subtraction could be function zero if I wanted it to be. This is why clear labeling is critical. Without it, I would not know what the machine is doing. The internal circuit of an ALU looks like this. First, note that this is a combinational circuit. There is no clock connected to this, so the outputs change immediately when the inputs change, following the propagation delay. Notice the tournament style approach. All of the eight possible functions are available at the front end of the ALU, but then the multiplexers decide which functions make it through each level until finally just one is selected for the output. A common theme in this course has been the utility of MUXs, and I hope it is evident here. They allow for this tournament style building block approach, as opposed to a more direct design approach, such as making a giant truth table, converting to some of the product's form, and converting to all NAND gates. That certainly could be done, but think of all those gates and how difficult it would be to troubleshoot. But in this more human-friendly approach, we can build and test each of these functions individually. Then we can drop them into this pattern. In fact, we could relatively easily expand this ALU to 16 functions by adding more devices, say a bit shifter, a divider, or bitwise NAND. Compartmentalization is powerful. Speaking of which, we can go further down the rabbit hole. For example, inside this multiplier device are a number of other devices, which contain other devices, which at the very end contain just gates. Never lose sight of this fact. We have done many layers of abstraction in this course, but at the bottom of every computer are just logic gates, simple ands, nots, ors, etc that operate on electrical signals, which we think of as individual bits. If you can understand those basic logic operations, you can eventually build up to these more complex functional circuits. Pause for a second and just reflect on the wonder of that fact. Wow. So that was the structure of our ALU or calculator. How does that fit into the larger processor region? Well, we need some way to pass in the data inputs. This gets tricky because all the data is routed through the data bus, which means A and B cannot be accessed from memory simultaneously. Registers to the rescue. This register in front of the B inputs is known as the working register. It is not part of our main memory, but instead serves as temporary memory for B while the processor is busy accessing the data for A. Let's say we want to perform subtraction, which this ALU is set up to perform as B minus A. During one clock cycle, we should access the desired value for B from a memory address, route it through this demultiplexer to the working register, and clock it into that register on the next positive edge. Then, during the next clock cycle, access the desired A value and route it through the other outlet of the demultiplexer. Now, B and A are in their proper places and the subtraction is performed. Since the DMUX and ALU are both combinational circuits, the second half can all be done before the next clock edge, which prepares the final output to be clocked into this next register, named the accumulator. The accumulator is a temporary holding place for the ALU output. 
The result can then be written to any of the RAM registers, but it must first have access to the data bus. That leads us to this buffer. Most of the time, such as when reading data from memory, this accumulator buffer will be unenabled, thus blocking this data from reaching the bus. Only when control determines that the accumulator data is ready to be passed on is this buffer enabled. At that point, write mode could be activated, a RAM address selected, and the data clocked in to that RAM register. This entire process sounds complicated, but it can all be done in three clock periods. During period one, the B data is read from memory and stored into the working register. During period two, the A data is read from memory, the ALU performs its operation, and the result is stored in the accumulator. During period three, the accumulator data is passed on to the bus and then written into memory. I hope you can begin to see how this example microprocessor reflects this conceptual drawing. I also hope you can see how the memory and processor regions serve different roles, but work together, united through the data bus. In the next video, you will see it all come together with a complete example operation.